standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages, let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I now can see. Perfect present cleansing in the blood for me. Standing in the liberty where Christ makes free, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. What a joy divine Leaning on the everlasting arms What a blessedness What a peace is mine Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alarms everlasting arms oh how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way leaning on the everlasting arms oh how bright the path rose from day to day leaning on the everlasting arms leaning leaning safe and secure from all everlasting arms I have blessed peace with my Lord so near leaning on the everlasting arms leaning leaning safe and secure from all alarms leaning 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 on the everlasting arms from all alarms leaning 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 on the everlasting arms
ocean skies A thousand years are nothing in your sight From God, when joy and tragedy collide, and loss reminds us life is but a sigh from Grace, you're making all things new. So satisfy us in our number days. Establish every effort while we wait from
Thank you all for singing with us this morning. You may be seated. Morning, everybody. I don't mean to be flippant about things, but that last song with the words, the earth shall dissolve like snow, Kind of looking forward to that day. <clears throat> I know that'll be a little hotter than, you know, we plan, but, man, <clears throat> we're supposed to get more, I guess, this week. So, um, let me mention um, or comment on something that Scott, giving the announcements, mentioned. A week from this Wednesday, during our normal adult Bible study in here in the sanctuary, he mentioned that we're having a membership class. Um, that's, that's for those of you that have that always come to that study, go ahead and show up, even though we'll take a break from our study of ethics. Um, but that's not a class that, um, if you take it, you are obligated to become a member. It's just that we have Man, I can't remember. It's been a while. It's been some months or so since we've had a membership class. And um, with <clears throat> newer people attending, we want to just give that opportunity. Uh, come and listen to it, uh, the denomination that we're a part of. And, and we study what, what we believe, our doctrinal statement, our church government, and a little bit of denominational history. Um, and then you're free to do whatever you want. So that's what will be taking place a week from this Wednesday night. 
If you have your Bibles, um, and of course you're not supposed to have electronic devices, but um, nevertheless, Romans 8. <clears throat> if it didn't take so long, we'd read the whole chapter, but we, we just can't. But um, we'll break in at the end of, right at the end of a paragraph in verse 16 and read through <clears throat> the rest of the chapter. Verse 16, The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the, rege the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren." And these whom he predestined to be like his son, he also called. These whom he called, he justified. These whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies, who is the one who condemns. Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The thought that I have, I hope, parallels this passage of Scripture. And I don't, I don't want to scare anybody. I don't want to discourage anybody. But we, can't, we always have to face reality. We're, we're in, I think, we're in days um, of gathering clouds gathering storm clouds. We see, and I'm not going to get off into end times. I've never been an end times person. Um, not that I don't believe in them, but I've just 
if you're not ready to meet God and you drop dead, I don't care who 666 is, okay? Um, so, nevertheless, I, I feel a lot of questions from you and others. Are we, with all we see, the total collapse of the values, the Christian values of Western civilization, and the unbelievable, unimaginable, and unpredictable, even a year or two ago, depravity that we see, people say, is this the end? The only thing I'd say about that is, for 2,000 years in church history, there have been probably 2,000 times that people have thought, this is it. Jesus' return is imminent. Um, you know, sell the farm and wait on a hill because it's coming next Friday. That all kinds of people predicted all kinds of stuff. There's always been one thing that runs through the whole pattern, really, of predicting Jesus coming again. The collapse of a society in which the people lived who believed this is the end, was always regional. It was a local society. It was a, maybe a small country. Even in the case of the Roman Empire, it, as it began to fracture, it still wasn't global. Every time that there arose a movement of end times focus, that Jesus is nearly here. It's always been restricted. It's been a smaller area. To me, the only thing that differs, because God's seen depravity, worse than we're seeing right now. Worse than you can read about what's going on in the schools and on Fox News or whatever. God's seen a whole lot worse than what we're dealing with here. He saw, he saw enough that he drowned the entire lot and left eight people. So he's seen it worse than we see it. However, the one thing that I think is different about the great falling away that we see going on today is it's global. It's not just America. Now, I know enough people that are involved in missions and so forth. There are wonderful revivals taking place in Africa, South America, Southeast Asia. All of Western, the Western world, is collapsing morally. Um, so even with those bright spots in the world, there's still a global sense of falling away that I don't think in history we've seen before. In the light of all that, I don't know how you feel, but um, it affects us. Uh, it affects me. I know I shouldn't read the news, but I'm addicted to it. Um, I, I want to know what's going on so I can talk back to the television or my phone or tell Liz what an absolute nitwit so-and-so is. Um, I hate to not know what's going on, but once I read it all and listen to all of it, then I'm, you know, I'm in a depressed hole that it takes me a month to get out of. As we face all this, this is a very appropriate passage. This was written when Nero was the emperor. Persecution had already begun. It was to get much, much, much worse. And this is in the first century. The persecutions in the Roman Empire continued with some breaks in between, but continued up until the, the final and worst was in the early 300s. 
And they were horrible. The Holy Spirit, of course, knew that was coming. So he inspired Paul to write this for encouragement, for exhortation to hold steady, and to remind us that though we will be glorified, he said, we are not going to be glorified without some suffering. There's a pattern here. The pattern is Jesus. The pattern, Jesus was glorified, but Jesus suffered. Especially in our country, we've not suffered. The only war we've had on our land, really, that was, um, was the Civil War, as far as we've never really been invaded. We've not had a wretched enemy conquer us and obliterate. We've never faced that. We, and so there are clearly, I believe, lots of Americanized interpretations of Scripture. Oh, God will, that God will help us. God will protect us. We carry that. We carry that to He will grant us exemption from suffering. That's not the way the New Testament or even the Old looked at it. We will go through suffering, but God will strengthen us in and through it, but not exempt us. We know that there's we support, my wife and I, we support, and I know a number of you do, Voice of the Martyrs. And we get their monthly stuff, and uh, for a while in college, one of our sons worked at their headquarters. We're about the only place that isn't dealing with persecution for being a Christian. Yet somehow we think, well, we may see it, it may get to the front porch, but Jesus won't let us let it get in our house. Listen, that's not true. It's not true. He said we'll suffer. So what do we do about it? This is what that passage is about. First of all, kind of as an introductory point, who are the participants he's talking to here? If you look at from verse 16, don't count them, I did it for you. Beginning with, well, I'm actually 14, but to the rest of the chapter, there's about 50 times where the words we and us appear. Well, who is this? Then who's this written to? A very early, probably the first question that we look at when we look at a passage of Scripture is, in trying to interpret it, who's this written to? We know who the writer is. Who are the recipients of this letter? It's the people, he said, who love God, called according to His purpose, believers. He called them brothers and sisters. It's us. It's every person that loves God, been born of the Spirit, and he speaks, we who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we groan. We are grieved. If we read on it in the next chapter, which we're not going to do, Paul starts out the next chapter, he said, I'm so grieved daily, he said, I could even wish that I myself were cut off from Jesus for the sake of my Israelite brothers who have turned away from the truth. And Paul said, I have, I have uh, tears and grief in my heart daily. We go through valleys. We go through the veil of tears. We go through hardships. But what we have to remember are, I think, four things here. First of all, in verse 31, what shall we say to all of these things? 
If God is for us, who's against us? Now, I think the Holy Spirit himself has to help that sink down into our hearts so we grab a hold of it. And it's kind of like, um, well, when they built this building. We, there's, there's, there's a million dollars. <laughs> there's a million dollars under the dirt here. That's how much the foundation cost to put pilings down, in some cases 50 feet, to a certain compactable reading so that the skeleton of this building would be on solid ground. You can't see it. But, it's, but we wouldn't have this without the foundation. The foundation here in this whole passage is the protection of God. If God is for us, who could be against us? If God's for us, there isn't anybody. We would say, well, there's the devil. Yeah, but he's defeated. He's already defeated. His only weapon, really, is accusation, deceit, and fogging up our feelings and picking on us and slandering God to us. But it's, it's all fake. He is a defeated foe. If God's for me, who else? Who else could ever be against me effectively? I read a lot of church history, a lot of world history, and World War II, 1st of September 1939, the Germans went into Poland. About a day or so later, England and France declared war on them. Winston Churchill was a voice crying in the wilderness for a good 10 years before the Second World War. He kept warning everybody that he knew they were going to be dealing with Germany again. The newspapers constantly made fun of him. Um, he was a member of parliament, but they talked about, and they likened him, they said, to the positivity. They said, Churchill has the positivity of the prophet Jeremiah, um, who was the darkest prophet in, in the scripture. And no one listened to him. Ironically, all the warning that he gave that everybody, ah, that's not going to happen. Then he ended up inheriting the war that resulted from nobody listening to him. But when they declared war, you get into 1940 and the Battle of Britain with the nighttime bombings, just harrowing days, terrible days. And meanwhile, there was a savior, at least as Britain looked at it, there was a savior across the ocean. And Churchill was caught between the desperation that they were in. They were running out of armament. They were, run, they, they were, going, to, they were going to lose. And he looked across the ocean and did his best to deal with Franklin Roosevelt in a way that wouldn't set him off and he was facing strong opposition in America to get involved in a European war. And so nobody here wanted to have anything to do with it. And he could see that they were eroding their strength. They were losing their strength. And this went on for nearly two years. And they were losing their, I mean, high rates of, of casualties and killed and so forth. And it... Britain's situation got more, gradually, more and more and more desperate. And Churchill more and more was, was doing his best to hold back and not be too bold, but pleading with America, you can help us, you can help us, we need your help. And it was put off, it was put off, it was put off. In fact, it was put off until after 
Pearl Harbor. So it was almost two years that Britain was desperately looking for, but trying not to upset, America. Finally, when Japan attacked, it turned the tide. Obviously, Churchill wasn't glad. No one was glad that a bunch of our people were lost at Pearl Harbor, but he knew it'll bring America into the war. They can't stay on the sidelines any longer. And so he had a phone call with Churchill, or Churchill with Roosevelt. And Roosevelt, you know, the day or so, two days after Pearl Harbor, declared war. Germany declared war. They declared, we declared war on Germany. And in his diary, Churchill just wrote this after this call from Roosevelt, we're in. He said, that night, I went to bed and slept the sleep of the saved. <laughs> I'm saved. Now, that was a physical thing, but the, the very future of that island was on the line. And he knew someone greater than us has to help us. And he slept the sleep of the saved. We are supposed to, by faith in Jesus, sleep the sleep of the saved. Because if God's for us, not just America's now on our side, if God's for us, who in the world can be against us? The matters. Nobody. Protection. In the middle of all we see, God will be with us. He may not exempt us from the issues that we think are facing us. And Jesus himself said, iniquity will grow worse and worse. He, we're seeing it. But God's with us. On his deathbed, the last words of John Wesley, he just raised his hands and he said, the best of all, God is with us. God's for us. Second, there's provision. This is a great verse, 32. He who did not spare his own son or did not withhold... And here this is um, underneath a reference to Abraham. The same language is used. Abraham, who God said to him, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, whom you love, and offer him as a burnt offering on the mountain I'll show you. Referencing this is referencing that. After Abraham raised the knife to slay Isaac, God called to him, stop, stay your hand. And he offered, he said, look around, and he turned and looked, and he said there was a ram caught in the thicket and by his horns, and he said, offer that instead of your son. Well, that represents the death of Jesus in our stead, in our place. Jesus was not spared. God the Father said, I won't even withhold him. The argument then Paul makes is, if God is that giving, if God didn't even withhold his only begotten son from us, how should he ever withhold any lesser thing from us. Would the God who opened his hand and gave his son to me, would he then not grant me grace, not give me strength, not give me protection, be stingy with his blessings, his help, his wisdom, his counsel, his defense of us? This, for me, personally, has often been a wonderful 
promise. If God didn't withhold his son, does he know how to help me? Does he know how to direct me and to strengthen me and encourage me? Give me direction? Give me leading when I don't know what in the world the next step is? Would that kind of a God be stingy with me who displayed that kind of giving? Not a chance. He freely said, how shall I, I think to King James, how, how much more will he with him, through Jesus, freely give us all things? All of heaven is available to me from the generous hand of this God who didn't spare his own son. The provision he gives, there's not one thing. Peter put it in the most expansive way. Simple little verse, he said, God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Well, what else is there? Everything of life, that's food, clothing, everything. His presence spiritually, His grace, His help, forgiveness, the atonement, freely gives me all things. Provision. This protection that he gave us in saying, if God's for us, who can be against us? Really, the next three, there are three questions to follow. One has to do with the past. One has to do with the present. The other has to do with the future. The past is the one we're looking at now. In the past, God provided his own son. In the generous, most generous gift you could imagine. Second, in the present, right now, today, this date, Notice this in verse 33 and 4. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? In other words, who will accuse us effectively? Satan does. He's one of his names. But it's not meant to work because we turn to God who justifies me. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Here's what I want you to think about. Every single one of us, probably, that have been Christians for a while, we have people that we think, you know, if I can just get so-and-so to pray... We have prayer chains, we have, you know, we get prayer requests out. But a lot of us think if I could just get old so and so, who's a saint, walked with God for 60 years, if I could just get them to pray for whatever this request is, it'll get through. <laughs> I don't know if that's bad thinking or not, but I've grown up doing that. I, I you know, I knew some wonderful preachers, seminary professors, people that knew God. And there was just kind of an innate thing. You know, if I pray, I hope it gets through, because um, I may be some kind of a loser on God's list. But, boy, if I can get Dr. So-and-so to pray. Listen, you know who prays for us? By name. Jesus. Not Dr. So-and-so, dear soul, great saint. Jesus is praying for me. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan's desire to sift you like wheat, put you through the sieve, separate you, make, find out who you are. It's going to be hard. You're going to flop. It was when he denied. But what did Jesus say? Notice where Jesus himself turned. It's a lesson to us. Jesus said, let's call a congregational meeting and let's have the board give a report and let's check with the treasurer to see how much money. No. 
Jesus himself said, Simon, Satan has gotten permission to put you to the test. But I have prayed for you. There's two, there's two you's in that little sentence. He said, Satan has desired all of you disciples that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed singular for you, Peter, by name. This was the Peter who just told Jesus, I'll die for you. He says, you'll deny me. Oh, no, he says, these duds might, but not me. Jesus then said, Satan's been after all of you, and he's going to put all of you through the sieve. But I prayed for you. You're the one standing in need of prayer, the one boasting about how you won't fail. I prayed for you, and it's singular. He named him. He ever lives, Hebrew says, to intercede for us. I'm, this is not just fluff. Every single one of us, Jesus prays for us by name. He sees the enemy's strategies, the temptations, the tests, the trials that are coming. He knows our thoughts. He understands our fears. He understands everything that we're going through. And what does he do? He's obviously got grace and gives it to us. But he's, he's our intercessor. He prays to the Father for me. How can, how can we lose Jesus prays for me. I, I want you to know every single one of you. Jesus prays for you by name. That is his current office until the end, the resurrection. Jesus prays for me. God for me. Who can be against me? I have protection. I've got Jesus praying for me. Verse 35, who will separate us? Here's the future. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Will those separate? One version, New Living Translation says, do you think Jesus' love for you has failed because you go through tribulation, trouble, difficulty? That's a very present temptation to us all. When things reverse and prayers we've prayed don't seem to be answered the way we had hoped, and when tribulation comes to us, tribulation means to crush us. Things that are tough, disappointing, distressing, worrisome, terrifying, all of that, he said, don't think Jesus doesn't love you because that's come to us. That's another prosperity gospel American interpretation of Scripture. That, oh, God, God is just... He, he rem you don't know Jim Lewis. He was in my dad's church in Eugene, Oregon, and when I was a little kid, um, Jim Lewis... He owned a couple restaurants. And he would come to church, and I don't know, well, of course you all wore a suit if you were a Christian. Um, and he'd have his pockets full of beech nut gum. Now, I suppose some people hate beech nut gum, but I thought beech nut gum was really great. And so he, and he would take them out of the package and then put them in his pocket. And all of us kids, we'd go up to him and he'd reach in and he'd give us beech nut gum. I don't know that I really cared about Jim Lewis. I mean, he's a nice guy. My dad talked about him in a good way, so I figured he must be a decent guy. He was always at church. Okay, he's fine. But what did I care about? Beach not come. If Jim had gotten ill and dropped dead or whatever else, the grief I would have had as a 10, 11-year-old even was not that Jim passed away, is, what am I going to do for the beech nut gum? A lot of Americans treat God like that. 
He's, he's the beech nut gum guy. And he needs to keep it coming. God said, we're going to suffer. Jesus was glorified, but he suffered. If we're going to follow him, we'll suffer too. And it may be mostly emotional, spiritual, worry, so forth, as we see the clouds gathering and the sky darkening. Whatever the suffering is, we will suffer. He never told us we wouldn't. Never. I'm not poking my finger at any of you. I'm probably the worst person who I don't like anything going wrong. Okay? Um, as long as everything goes just right, I can figure my phone out. Everything just goes right. First time we try something, first time, you know, you, this job, I'll tell Liz, we got, I got to do this little project, it might take a half an hour. I don't know why I do that, because it ends up taking three hours, 50 trips to Home Depot, and pulling what hair I've got left, and I'm irritated because it's not going right. Jesus already told us, it's not going to go right. <laughs> You're going to have setbacks, you're going to have trouble, you're going to have testings, you're going to have all these things. Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. It'll throw stuff at you, but you will, as the final verses here, we will be more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. He preserves us now, I'm not talking here about that, you know, there's no danger of us tripping up, walking away from God. I'm not talking about that. This isn't talking about that. But Peter put it best. We are, he said, kept by the power of God through faith. So as long as we cling to Jesus and trust him. I cannot, I cannot fall. I can't. He'll keep me. He's faithful. Now, there are a few words <clears throat> that I want to just close with. The words of an old hymn, don't know how old it is. <clears throat> how firm a foundation you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. The soul that on Jesus leans for repose he'll never no never desert to his foes that soul though all hell should endeavor to shake I'll never no never no never forsake that's our anchor God's with us Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we sat and listened this morning to your word, I was reminded, Lord, that there are sunny days as believers. But as we watch the horizon, Lord, we know we watch the clouds build we know the weather's changing at times, and we know our storms come. Help us to be a church that does not run from storms. We don't run from the storm, Lord. We run to our Savior in the midst of the storm. So whether it's sunny out or whether it's storming out, help us to always cling to you exactly like we've been taught this morning. There we make that confession that we are more 
than conquerors because we are your children. And for that, we're grateful. Thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the work that you've done in the past to extend redemption to us and salvation to us. I pray for those of us that have received that salvation that we cling to it tightly, Lord. Absolutely, utterly dependent on your Holy Spirit to get us through um, on this side of heaven until we hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And if there's someone sitting in here this morning, Lord, that needs to turn her heart back to you or that has never reached out to you and received that gift that you've offered, pray today is the day of salvation for them, that they would know that they're known and that they are a child of God and that their eternal destiny is in Christ Jesus and that your protection is here for us as we march toward that heavenly shore. Lord, we love you. And we are so grateful for you. Now help us to get up and walk out of this place with that light in our heart, walking by your grace to your glory in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.